Again, our sermon title this evening, he gave some to be pastors, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. I was uh, reading somewhere earlier in the week who said that uh, there is an element of worship in Christianity uh, that cannot be experienced in private worship or by watching worship. <laughs> I think about those subjects, that those statements uh, when considering our Sunday evening service together. I'm very grateful for our Sunday evening worship service. He says, there are some graces and blessings blessings that God gives only in the meeting together with other believers. And so it's important that we are able to come together for worship. And Sunday evening is certainly a, a big part of that. Those same spirit wrought graces and blessings that we should be looking forward to uh, all week in our worship of God's, uh, with God's people on Sunday morning, uh, that worship together that we should value, uh, those same blessings and graces are ours when we gather together for worship on Sunday evening as well, by God's grace. Uh, and first and foremost, we gather together for the purpose of worship. He is worthy of our worship and wor worthy of that worship that only the gathered, assembled saints are able to give. Uh, he is worthy of that worship. Uh, but also, we're here for those graces and blessings. Uh, those gifts of God himself that he gives to the gathered saints. Um, so we're blessed to be able to have a, an evening worship service together, and I'm thankful that you're here to join with us in that. Uh, we need to remind ourselves of those things from uh, now and again uh, to make sure that we remember them. Well, on Sunday evenings, we've begun uh, part two in our study of the essentials. One sermon, one subject, essential to the life, growth, maturity of the Christian. And part two in our study of the essentials is focused on the doctrine and practice of the church. So my hope this evening in that segment on the church is to provide for us an introduction now uh, to the office of elder or elder leadership in the Lord's church. And as is usual, our introduction here is going to be of necessity broad. My hope is to provide a good foundation, uh, maybe a foundation on which will uh, be good for you to build in future study on your own time. So we're gonna begin tonight considering the office of elder in the Lord's church. In Ephesians chapter four, the text read in your hearing, in the context of the unity of the church, Paul shifts to the individuals that make up that unity in verses 11 through 16. He begins, if you look at Ephesians chapter four, he begins with the basis of our unity in verses one through six, where Paul says, one body, one spirit, just as we were called in one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in us all. In other words, we have a glorious basis on which we should be unified as a people of God. But then Paul transitions to the means by which the Lord Christ has provided for that unity. Verse seven, and that means is this, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, that's fascinating to think about the connection between the gifts of grace that God gives to his church and the unity that a church enjoys. Uh, to each one, grace was given. That gift of grace is unique to each one of us. The Lord giving to each one, Paul says there, a measure of his grace according to his will. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. The apostle Paul there quoting Psalm 68. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ sovereignly distributes gifts to each of the members of his body, the church. Every Christian, every member of the body is called upon to serve the body of Christ for the building up of the whole. Every part is to do its share. And your ability to effectively serve the body is given to you by the grace of God. It's a gift to each one of the members of the body. And it's a gift that comes from the ascended Christ. Now, among those many and varied gifts that the risen Lord has given to the church, Paul mentions a representative list in verse 11. There are several of these gift lists throughout the New Testament, all of them merely representative, none of them exhaustive. And even if you add all of those gift lists together, we still don't get an exhaustive list. The Lord is very gracious in the way that he cares for his church. But listen to this representative list given to us in verse 11. And he himself, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, 
some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, the first two gifts mentioned there in verse 11 are apostles and prophets. Now, we've discussed the role of these men in prior sermons, so I won't belabor that point here, but Paul mentions them in chapter 2, verse 20, as laying the foundation for the teaching of the church. In other words, the apostles and prophets important to laying the foundation, but now that the foundation has been laid, we are building upon it with the teaching, the apostolic teaching of the word of God. In chapter three, verse five, that foundational doctrine was given to the apostles and prophets by direct revelation from the Holy Spirit. And these gifts have served their distinctive purpose. When you think about that in terms of its foundational purpose and in terms of direct revelation, there is no one today that qualifies for either of those office. No one today qualifies for the office of prophet or apostle. Evangelists listed there in verse 11 were those who were tasked to carry on the preaching of the gospel. In other words, they furthered the work of the apostles when the apostles uh, were not there, when the apostles left. And so, for example, Pastor Timothy, who is a delegate of the Apostle Paul, Pastor Timothy in Ephesus, was charged by Paul with doing the work of an evangelist, one of the few times that office is referred to in the New Testament. In other words, Timothy was to preach to unbelievers and to believers alike. Philip, one of the early uh, seven early deacons in the church, Acts chapter 6, was also called an evangelist, and we see that in its more formal sense. The final gifts then listed in verse 11 are pastors and teachers. Now, if you notice with me in verse 11, each of the gifts, gifts listed there are preceded by a definite article, the, that little word, the, in the Greek. It's the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists. But then you have a single definite article that precedes pastors and teachers. So based on the grammar then, uh, grammatically, those two seem to be linked together. There is overlap in the function of those two offices, so to speak. Uh, so much so, so much overlap, and in light of the grammar, that many have translated verse 11 as pastors who teach, or hyphenated the office. It's the office of pastor-teacher, uh, using those terms synonymously. We consider verse 11, I think it's best to see those two functions as very closely related but not necessarily synonymous, right? All pastors are gifted to teach, but not all teachers are gifted to be pastors. There's not an entire overlap, and the two aren't synonymous, but they are close and closely related. We see both functions, teachers and pastors, gifted and present in the life of the church. Our Confession of Faith, I think, says this wisely. The London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 26, Article 11, listen to what our confession says. Although it be incumbent on the bishops or pastors of the churches to be instant in preaching the word by way of office, yet the work of preaching the word is not so peculiarly confined to them, but that others also gifted and fitted by the Holy Spirit for it and approved and called by the church may and ought to perform it. So there are those who are gifted to be pastors those pastors are required by qualification to be teachers, and then there are also teachers in the church not necessarily gifted to be pastors. You have pastors and teachers, therefore. Now, that brings us, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, brings us to the specific office under our consideration this evening, the office of pastor. The word pastor in the Greek literally means shepherd. It's the verb form of a word that's used several times in Scripture to refer to the work that is required of this office in the church. It is the work of shepherding, so to speak. And the word pastor is the noun form of that verb. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, for example, the elders in the church at Ephesus were to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Um, that's a verb form of that word. They're to shepherd. And the church in that passage is called a flock. We can see the connection there, right? And as shepherds, the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of the Lord's flock. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, the elders in the church were to shepherd the flock of God, serving as 
overseers under the authority and accountability of the chief shepherd. Who's our chief shepherd? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're under shepherds, so to speak. He is the chief shepherd. Uh, Our confession of faith, again, chapter 26, article 10, the work of pastors being constantly to attend the service of Christ in his churches, in the ministry of the word and prayer, with watching for their souls as they, as they that must give an account to him. And already in describing the role of a pastor, describing the role of a shepherd, so to speak, we begin to use these other words like overseer, uh, that give us nuance to what the role of a pastor is in the Lord's church. And we'll see those words even in the New Testament. Now, even in this very brief reference to various texts in Scripture, we, see, we begin to see those various words used of this one specific office, the office of pastor. We see the word overseer. We also see the word elder. Each one of those words, pastor, overseer, elder, gives a particular nuance to the specific role, the specific responsibility of this singular office in the church. One office, various roles or various words used to describe the function of that office. And many of us, myself included, uh, came from a wide variety of church backgrounds. And we've come from all over the place before the Lord led us here. Uh, and in your church context, one or more of these specific words may have been used and might be more familiar to you. Uh, Some of you may have been used to the word pastor, like I was. They were all called pastors, really heard nothing much, very little of any of the other words, and they were all very foreign and strange to me. I had no idea what what an elder was, other than the fact that he was supposed to be old. (laughs) Um, And some of you may have grown up with bishops. I had really no idea where that came from and why bishop was being used. And notice here, as we describe these terms, or if we use these terms, I'm not using the term priest, because that's not one of the words that the New Testament uses. There's no such office in the Lord's church today. We are all kings and priests to our God. And notice I'm not using the term reverend. The word reverend is not an office in the church. The word reverend is an honorific title uh, that we don't use around here. Um, But Uh, We're talking about the specific office in the church, which refers to elders, pastors, overseers, or bishops. We'll talk about each of those titles. All right. In Scripture and over the history of the church, the noun forms of those verb responsibilities became titles for the office. For example... Uh, One of the roles or functions uh, of this leadership position in the Lord's church was to shepherd the flock of God. That shepherd is a verb, so the noun shepherd became a title for the office. Um, The one who is to watch over the flock or oversee the flock, that verb form uh, transferred to a noun, and that became the office of overseer, episkopos, or watchman, or Well, we'll talk about that in a moment as we work through the text. Verb responsibilities, all right? The scripture essentially uses three nouns for this one office. The Greek words presbyteros, episkopos, and poimen. Most frequently translated elder, it's the word presbyteros, bishop, the word episkopos, or overseer, and pastor, it's the word poimen, respectively. All of those words are masculine, which is also important to consider. In our particular context, we're used to referring to the office of elder or pastor. The word translated elder, presbyteros, in common usage simply does refer to an older man, someone who's a little older, may have gray hair, someone with some life experience, in other words, someone who's been around the block a time or two. The term would have, would have should have carried with it an expectation that along with his older age, uh, there would come some wisdom, some life experience that would lend to his wisdom and give him the ability to lead well. Paul uses the word as the technical term to refer to a leader given by Jesus Christ as a gift to his church. The term or the office of elder. Turn with me to Titus chapter one. Let's look at this text together. Titus chapter one. And look there, beginning with me at verse 5. In Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, Paul and Titus, 
had ministered together on the island of Crete. Paul had moved on to other missionary endeavors, but left Titus in Crete to continue the work that Paul had begun. And Paul writes back with this letter containing specific instructions to Titus for the purpose of establishing the churches that they had planted in various cities. And that's where we pick up in verse 5. Paul says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Now what Paul's doing here in verse 5, beginning to, is giving Titus a blueprint for how these churches would function. Titus is left in Crete to set things in order. That's going to be his responsibility. And the very first thing to set in order, the very first thing that is necessary to proper order in the Lord's church is to appoint leaders, to appoint leadership, here to appoint elders. Qualified leadership must come first, right? If if order is going to be established, if direction is going to be established, if there's going to be biblical teaching that goes on, if there's going to be order in the churches, we have to First, set in place biblical eldership or biblical leadership. Notice that Paul instructs Titus, his delegate, to appoint them. In other words, these leaders in the church don't appoint themselves. Once Paul or Titus would have left those churches in Crete, if they needed an elder, the church there in Crete would have appointed an elder for themselves, uh, just as the church here has appointed the elders that we have. The the elders didn't appoint themselves. They don't send themselves. They don't ordain themselves. That is the responsibility of the churches, right? And notice that the word here is plural. For this reason, I left you in Crete, verse 5, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders, plural, in every city as I commanded you. There would have likely been in Crete uh, one church in each city at this time, And in each church, in every city, Titus was to appoint elders, plural. Not one man, not one man with absolute despotic authority or totalitarian control over the churches in Crete, over everything that goes on, but men, plural, with shared responsibility, men with shared accountability. That becomes incredibly important to the church, incredibly important to the office of elder, Uh, in the New Testament. There are too many problems, too many difficulties, too many challenges associated with one leader. Even in the churches that we plant here, uh, many times the churches are small and we supply a plurality of eldership or a plurality of leadership. We supply the accountability that's necessary uh, by helping a brother through our elders at this church. And so we continue to help our sister church in New York or help our sister church in Guatemala uh, by providing an el- uh, a plurality among our elders here to work with that man that's leading the church there. So what is an elder then? Verse five, an elder is one of a plurality of appointed leaders in a local church. I think that's a fair definition of the term. An elder is one of a plurality of appointed leaders in a local church. Well, what should that elder's qualifications be then? Well, Paul gives those qualifications to Titus, beginning in verse 6. He says, If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Now notice, we're not going to go into details about the qualifications here. That's for another sermon. But with specific reference to the office, notice verse 6, it's a man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, roots this mandate in a creation ordinance, and therefore the mandate for male elders is timeless. Uh, Paul says to Timothy that Adam was formed first, then Eve. And that's what happened at creation. The requirement that an elder be a man is rooted in that creation ordinance that God formed Adam first and then Eve. Furthermore, Paul goes on to Timothy, Eve, not Adam, was deceived. And so another reason that uh, male elders are appointed in verse 6 is do the fall in the garden and the deception of Eve. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that he must rule his own household well, so these men must know how to manage their own household. And if he does not know how to rule his own house, how then will he take care of the church of God? 
So it must be that he rules his household well. A man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For, or it follows, verse seven, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. He has a stewardship, he has a responsibility, and he is accountable to God for his execution of his office. Then that blamelessness is described further as, verse seven, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. And notice, Paul uses the word bishop, did you see that, episkopos, of the same office in verse seven. He uses the word elder in verse five, the word bishop in verse seven of the same office. That word episkopos, the word translated bishop in verse seven, is a compound Greek word. It's made up of two Greek words, epi, meaning over, and skapos, referring to sight or vision. So it's oversight. It's literally what the word means when you put it together. It refers to someone who is given the responsibility to watch over the Lord's church. Someone given responsibility and authority and accountability to watch over, to care for, and to tend to the Lord's church. So in Crete, things have to be set in order. That good order needs to be maintained. How do we do that? How do we maintain good order in the churches? We appoint an episkopos, a bishop, an overseer, overseer necessary for the work. We put responsible and accountable elder men in place and give them oversight. They are charged with a stewardship of the Lord's church. And notice in Titus chapter one, that Paul is not referring to a hierarchy. Not referring to a hierarchy as in the Catholic church or in the Episcopal churches, but simply to an office in the local church charged with oversight. Many of you, based on the church background that you came out of, you're used to hearing that word bishop and you think layers or hierarchies among a clergy class of leaders in the church. Not so in the New Testament. That is foreign in the New Testament. That's not what the Bible teaches. These are, there's no hierarchy here. This is just another word for the same office of one who is given charge with oversight of the Lord's church. And notice it's not his church. He's simply a steward or uh, sometimes used to hearing that so-and-so's church or pastor so-and-so's church. Technically, it's not his church. It's the Lord's church. And we have qualified, a qualified plurality of men who are given stewardship for oversight. They are bond slaves. I like to consider them uh, galley slaves, uh, sheep dogs sometimes, uh, men charged with oversight. Under the authority of another, in other words, under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, not pursuing his own agenda, not pursuing his own will, but the will of the chief shepherd. Now this speaks not only to who he is, but to what he does. So what does this elder or bishop or steward do in his responsibility of oversight? Look with me at verse nine. What does this elder do? He, verse nine, holds fast the faithful word as he has been taught so that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So then elders are charged with being stewards of the church and elders charged with this stewardship execute their stewardship through the teaching of sound doctrine or teaching the truth. They teach the truth in the church and they, with sound doctrine, exhort and convict those who contradict. For, verse 10, there's a reason why this is necessary. There's a reason that these men are charged with this uh, function Because, verse 10, there are many insubordinate. If you've been around this church for any length of time, uh, you're aware that the Lord's admonition here is true. (laughs) The Lord's warning here is true. There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. How are they stopped? Through preaching and teaching the truth. Right through teaching sound doctrine, exhorting and convicting those who contradict. 
Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And the Lord has warned us several places in scripture that this would be the experience of the Lord's church. In other words, the teaching ministry of an elder or the teaching ministry of an overseer also serves a pastoral function. And not just a teaching function, but a pastoral function. And we see those three words, again, overlapping, presbyteros or elder, episkopos or bishop, poimen or shepherd. For an example of this function or responsibility, turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Let's see this in action. Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, we see the example of the Apostle Paul. We also see the example of the elders of the church in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, Paul had been preaching the gospel in Troas when he is about to board a ship in order to press on for Jerusalem. Paul's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, and so he doesn't have time to press into Asia Minor toward Ephesus. Paul is going to stay on the coast, and he calls for the elders in Ephesus to meet him over on the coast at Miletus so that he can meet with them before he goes to Jerusalem. His aim is to make it to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So bypassing Ephesus, he calls for the elders. The church at Ephesus, like all of those planted by the Apostle Paul around Asia Minor, were established by apostolic preaching. They were established by apostolic authority. But Paul obviously wasn't always going to be with them, right? Paul had to leave this church. And so Paul labored to prepare these churches to continue in his absence. One of the ways that he did that to prepare them to continue in his absence was by setting up elder leadership in the church, by appointing an elder, an episkopos, a poimen, a shepherd, a pastor, a bishop. So Paul labored to set these churches up and setting up each church, in each church, the regular ministry of ordaining elders and deacons in the church. And so elders were appointed in each church to preach and teach and lead the people. There were no hierarchies. There were no synods. There were no sessions. There was no magisterium. There was no diocese. Just local churches led by a plurality of elders. So the church at, El uh, at Ephesus is about 30 miles away from Miletus. The el elders at the church at Ephesus make the trek over to Miletus to meet with Paul. And we pick that up in verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. When they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is a very good example of what a pastor or an elder or a bishop should aspire to. Paul is a good example of a pastor's heart, of a pastor's function. And so what is the first function that we see here Paul fulfilling, beginning in verse 17, is teaching function. A Paul held nothing back, taught the whole counsel of God, proclaimed it to them, taught them publicly from house to house, Paul saw it as his responsibility to teach sound doctrine. Titus chapter one, verse five, do you see? It's a teaching function. He's to tend the church by teaching sound doctrine. And Paul does that with great zeal. Verse 22, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Listen to Paul's heart in verse 24. But none of these things move me. The chains and tribulations, that kind of persecution. And Paul says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and finish the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There is a teaching function that is necessary among those men who would be elders in the Lord's church. Listen, there's also 
this pastoral concern of protecting the Lord's church. We see that beginning in verse 25. Protection and provision. Look at verse 25. And indeed now, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Now, Paul is about to get on the boat and sail away as those elders from that church at Ephesus stay on the shore and watch him leave, never to see his face again. And they're tasked with the responsibility of keeping things in order at the church in Ephesus. Paul is leaving. Paul is going to give them departing words. Look at verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. This is the teaching function. Verse 28, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. In other words, perform the function of an episcopos, an overseer. Watch over yourself and watch over all the flock. Why? among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, there's that word, to shepherd, there's the other word, the church of God. Can you see how these words come together to form overlapping nuance to the functions of this one singular office, right? Um, this is the office of elder. He, the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. They're charged with shepherding the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Four, verse 29. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul knows that this is exactly what's going to take place, and he warns them. He has been warning them every day, night and day, with tears, for the three years that he was among them there. And this refers to this pastoral protection, uh, this responsibility of a pastor to also watch over the flock in a protective sense. We think about this in terms of uh, the role of shepherd. You see in this Paul's pastoral heart, right? He doesn't hold anything back. There's an unwavering commitment to the truth and Paul's pastoral heart in caring for the church uh, against those that would seek to do it harm. Albert Martin said this. He says, by using the verb form of the noun shepherd, Paul is charging these elders to perform in a spiritual way the functions which a shepherd performs toward his flock in a literal and physical way. So in other words, a physical, literal shepherd provides the illustration for this office of a shepherd in the Lord's church, this office of pastor. That word poimain, uh, translated pastor in Ephesians chapter four, also translated shepherd here, right? He assumes that the men from Ephesus that met with him in Miletus, the elders of the church, have been gifted by God to this function. In other words, God gives grace to those he has gifted to the office. In other words, he's the one, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he's the one who makes us sufficient for our office, makes us sufficient to perform the functions required of us. He gives them gifts in order to perform this function. Function of leading the flock. If you think about the role of a, of a shepherd of a flock of sheep, what is that shepherd uh, supposed to do for the sheep? He's to feed the flock, He's to guide and direct the flock. He's to protect the flock from wolves. And with that literal physical role or function of a shepherd, we can see some of the role or function of a shepherd in the Lord's church. He's to lead the flock to healthy, nourishing, green pastures. Uh, for example, there are healthy, nourishing, green pastures in the book of Romans. <laughs> and we're going to frolic in those green pastures and eat to our full uh, from that blessed letter. We're to lead the flock to healthy, nourishing green pastures. We're to guide them to refreshing streams of fresh spiritual springs of water. We're to protect them from spiritual wolves from without. And we're to protect, protect them from perverse men who rise up from within. In other words, the role is essentially the same. We're to feed, we're to guide, we're to protect from dangers within and from dangers without. Paul essentially says, I'm leaving, right? I'm departing. You're not going to see my face any longer. 
And similar to the words that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples in John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, as he was preparing to leave them via the cross, the Lord is giving them parting wolves and he, uh, parting words, and he warns them of wolves. Not unlike the good shepherd right? in John chapter 10, the one who is not the hireling who flees when he sees the wolves coming, but protects the flock. And not wolves in wolves' clothing, right? Uh, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, they don't look necessarily like wolves, but in fact turn out to be wolves nonetheless. The worst enemy often of the church is the false teacher. Uh, there have been many attacks against the Lord's church from without. Those attacks uh, have never uh, done in the Lord's church. There are many, many insidiously deceptive and devastating attacks that take place from within the Lord's church. And that is one of the enemy's um, tools, schemes that we should not be ignorant of. These are savage wolves, not merely harmful wolves or hurtful wolves. These are savage wolves. And the church at Ephesus is to be on their guard, knowing that these men will sneak in among them with the purpose or with the desire of leading disciples away after themselves. You know, it's interesting to think about this church at Ephesus because um, given time, there are problems in Ephesus and problems that we have responsibility, um, oversight responsibility of protecting the Lord's church from. It's in the, the book of Revelation that we find that Ephesus lost her first love and the Lord addresses the church at Ephesus and calls her to repentance. Um, we are to be watchful over the church. They watched Paul leave. He left his inspired teaching with them, just as Paul has left his inspired teaching with us. We have it with us today, and we are to safeguard it. We're to proclaim it. We're not to hold anything back. So with that in mind, turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And look back there again with me at verse 11. Let's put this together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Now, thinking about all those words, thinking about that particular function, the nuance of that role, listen again to what Paul says in verse 11. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The Lord doesn't merely give the man, but he also gifts the man. He gives a measure of grace in order to perform that function. To what end does he do this for his church? Verse 12. For that man to do all the work of the ministry. No. <laughs> no, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Another function of an elder in the Lord's church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to help them grow in their ability to perform the functions, the ministry which God has given to them, the graces which he has given them to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the purpose of edifying or building up the body until, verse 13, we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that, and here's this protective function again, right? So that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But, rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In other words, the Lord gives this function in the church to facilitate, to cultivate the growth of the body. And if a man works and labors faithfully in that office, that's what happens. The church grows and the church matures and the church is protected and there's good oversight and good order as it should be in the Lord's church. Uh, one of the, the pictures that comes to mind in this, in particular, uh, with respect to the office of pastor poimane, uh, the word that's often translated shepherd, 
is that thought that there is a chief shepherd to whom he is accountable. Uh, he has a delegated function, so to speak, a delegated authority. The chief shepherd is the one who is shepherd over his church, over his flock. Uh, we are under shepherds, so to speak, um, to do his will. And it reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ on the beach with Peter in John chapter 21, uh, when the Lord asks him, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And feed my sheep, tend my sheep, right? What was Peter to do? Uh, Peter is to care for the flock of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to ascend into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's going to leave care and oversight of the flock in Peter's hands. And he asks Peter, he charges Peter to take care of his sheep. And what the beautiful picture of that is, is that the Lord is the chief shepherd, but through a loving and gracious extension of his own love and care and concern for the church, he appoints under shepherds, um, men, elders in the church who are um, his hands and feet, so to speak. They're a means by which the Lord himself loves, cares for, and matures and readies his bride. It was a beautiful picture of the Lord's love for his body. Uh, we want this church, the blessings that we have enjoyed here, uh, the growth and maturity that we've enjoyed here, the peace and the unity that we've enjoyed here, we want these good blessings to last. So I know the elders here, uh, our heart is to, uh, to labor to this end, that we care for uh, the Lord's flock as he has called us to. Uh, we are accountable to you, so you hold us accountable to that end and let us labor together. We want to build up, equip the body for the work of the ministry uh, that we might preserve and prosper the Lord's cause among his church. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we're very grateful for your wisdom and in appointing elders in the church, this office of elder. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your wisdom in caring for your church in this way. Uh, help the elders here, Lord. Help us to serve you well, to serve you faithfully. Uh, strengthen us, uh, supply us, uh, give us wisdom. Uh, Lord, preserve us, protect us, cause us to be holy. Uh, cause us, Lord, to be good examples to the flock. Help us to labor diligently. And Lord, work uh, by your grace in us and through us for the good of your body. It's not that we are in and of ourselves worthy or, or, or deserving of such grace, uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. And Lord, I pray that you would, through the means that you've appointed in your church, make his bride ready. Uh, you would wash her and nurture her and protect her and care for her. And uh, Lord, help us to, to be faithful to you uh, and to this end. And I pray, Lord, for our uh, precious people here, this body, this local expression of your church, that uh, you would build them up in their faith, that you would equip them for the work of the ministry, uh, that you would bring about among us the obedience of faith, and that we would be faithful to you in the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ for your glory, for his exaltation, for our good. We pray these things in his name. Amen.